on this Saturday night, one dose or two? The debate over the second vaccine shot. We should not be waffling on this. It's too, too critical right now. Plus the change to temperature that may speed up the vaccination program. The new challenges facing the U.S. as it aims to get every American vaccinated by summer. Justice reform in Canada. It's rooted in the judgment. Is it time to judge the judges? And they were trailblazers in the NHL. The push to get more diverse players to follow in their skates. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. As vaccine deliveries ramp up across this country, there is a push to make the shots go even further. In Canada, over 1.4 million doses have now been administered. The majority of those vaccines are coming from Pfizer-BioNTech. New data shows it's highly effective after just one dose. And as Abigail Beeman reports, some health experts say Canada should focus on getting one shot into as many arms as possible. British Columbia and Quebec are both reporting the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is about 80% effective after just one dose. We should not um, be uh, waffling on this. It's too, too critical. While in a letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine, Dr. Danuta Skaronsky argues the first dose is more than 90% effective. She still supports getting a second shot, but wants to make sure everyone vulnerable gets their first dose first. Hospitalizations and deaths that accrue now should be considered vaccine preventable with the first dose. The data is certainly encouraging. Jason Kindrachuk says there's still much we don't know about vaccine effectiveness. Does that extend out uh, far beyond where we would normally give the second dose? Is it only sustained for a short period of time? And that's really the question that we you know, can't answer at this point. In the negative 60 or below temperature range. Meanwhile, Pfizer applied to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration with data to show the vaccine can be stored at much warmer temperatures, around minus 20 degrees Celsius, for two weeks. This new storage option would offer pharmacies and vaccination centers greater flexibility in how they manage their vaccine supply. Pfizer tells Global News it will make the same request to Health Canada in the coming weeks and it could make a big difference here where remote locations aren't using the vaccine due to the challenges. We stand by ready to assess it when they apply. The first dose efficacy is also under review. That's a very live um, discussion right now and the analysis is going on but it is incredible I think that we have such an efficacious tool. Dr. Tam says data showing the vaccine is highly effective among the most elderly and vulnerable members of society is also promising, noting clinical trials had many younger, healthier participants. Robin? Abigail Beeman in Ottawa. Thanks, Abigail. The spread of the highly transmissible COVID-19 variants has prompted the federal government to extend the Canada-U.S. border closure. All land border crossings will remain closed to non-essential travel until at least March 21st. That day will mark exactly one year since the border was shut down in an effort to slow the spread of the virus. The pandemic is just one topic Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will discuss with U.S. President Joe Biden next week. The two leaders are scheduled to hold a virtual bilateral meeting on Tuesday. It will be Biden's first official meeting with a foreign head of government since taking office. The president is investing in more vaccines. Already 1.9 million shots are being given each day and cases dropped by 29 percent compared to this time last week. But as Reggie Cicchini explains, despite those positive developments, there are still significant challenges. It's a small sign of progress in the United States. COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations are at five-week lows. We have made progress, but we have a long way to go. While there is a light at the end of the tunnel, the road to recovery is lined with constant reminders of the toll this pandemic has taken. 500,000 Americans will have died from COVID-19. Slowing that rise is a massive undertaking. Touring Pfizer's facility in Michigan on Friday, President Joe Biden lauded efforts to ramp up production to 200 million shots by May, but at the same time offered a dose of reality. It doesn't mean it'll be in all Americans' arms, but enough vaccine will be available by that time. Many states are struggling to administer what vaccine they have. 
meaning they could be sitting on stockpiles. It is critical that we figure out any way possible to try to double or even triple the vaccine numbers that we have. The White House has a target of vaccinating all adults by summer, hoping for a return to normalcy by year's end. But there are challenges. Emerging variants could become dominant strains in the near future and threaten efforts to lower case numbers. Vaccination programs should be thinking about a booster dose option. They should be thinking about changing the strain like we do that in flu uh, vaccine. Meanwhile, a key indicator of public health is signaling distress. Life expectancy in the United States dropped by one full year in the first half of 2020 to 77.8 years. But for black Americans, it dropped by almost three years, highlighting disparities faced by racial communities during this pandemic. There is just a consistent gap across the board in everything from education, finance and income. And every time we come up with solutions, we find that they're necessary but not sufficient. And health officials say controlling this virus isn't going to end decades of inequities faced by minority communities. And the White House has actually made vaccine equity a key component in its strategy to combat this pandemic. They're also working to instill confidence in a population that includes some of the country's most vulnerable. Robin? Reggie Giacchini in Washington. Thanks, Reggie. In the southern U.S., warmer temperatures are bringing much-needed relief to the storm-battered region. Today, President Biden declared a major disaster in Texas, allowing more federal funding to flow to the state. Two back-to-back storms are being blamed for at least 69 deaths in several states. Millions of Americans still don't have safe drinking water, and tens of thousands remain without power. A developing story in Colorado, where a passenger jet has landed safely after plane parts fell from the sky on a residential neighborhood. This large piece of the United Airlines Boeing 777 landed in a yard barely missing the home. Other metal debris fell on a sports field and on roads. It happened shortly after the plane took off, en route from Denver to Honolulu with 240 people on board. There are no reports of any injuries. In Newfoundland and Labrador, the deadline for mail-in ballots has been extended. The provincial election was disrupted by spiking COVID-19 cases, and election officials were forced to cancel in-person voting. But not everyone is confident in how the process is unfolding. As Ross Lord explains, the turmoil could continue even after the votes are tallied. A makeshift plan that relies on mail-in ballots and a four-week delay for results could be just the start of election turmoil in Newfoundland and Labrador. No matter which party ends up with the most votes, the election is widely expected to end up in court. I think it seems likely. It's hard to tell at this early stage. I've definitely heard rumblings about various kinds of constitutional challenges that are being contemplated. Something had to give. Election workers, many elderly volunteers, were quitting, afraid they'd contract COVID-19 at polling stations. Just hours before the February 13th election date, the province's chief electoral officer finally settled on a safer option, voting exclusively through the mail. It is a tried and true method of of making sure that uh, uh, people are able to participate in the election. But some analysts question whether extending voting day for the entire province is allowed under election law. And they say the mail-in system could deny some voters their rights, especially in parts of Labrador, where slow mail service, language barriers, and spotty phone and internet services can undermine applying for and returning ballots, which must be postmarked for return by March 12th. Even without court challenges, there are concerns voters who are nervous about the outbreak and frustrated by election disruptions have lost their faith. Now it appears at this point that the, the die has been cast and they're going forward, but uh, it does leave, leave a question about how much confidence people will have in the election results. The elections office says it's using extra tech resources and it's hired a call center to help smooth out the process. But there's still a long way to go before anyone can call this election a success. Ross Lord, Global News. Now to the allegations of inappropriate behaviour levelled against Canada's former top soldier, General Jonathan Vance. Canadians will soon hear from someone at the very heart of those allegations. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson broke the story earlier this month and has a preview of what's coming up tomorrow on the West Block. General Jonathan Vance swore to stamp out sexual misconduct in the Canadian forces. 
He even made it possible to dismiss troops accused of sexual misconduct, concerned that existing mechanisms did not allow for severe enough punishment. Now General Vance is under investigation by military police after Global News reported allegations of sexual misconduct. One of an inappropriate relationship with a subordinate while she was under his command and while he was chief of the defense staff. He is also alleged to have sent an inappropriate email to a young soldier who he offered career advice to. Vance was also investigated in 2015 by military police over a third allegation of inappropriate behavior with a woman he outranked, who is now his wife. Vance has denied all of the allegations. But this week on the West Block, we are going to hear from a woman at the center of this story, telling her story and what it means for women in the Canadian military. On Friday, Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan was grilled by opposition MPs on what he knew about allegations brought to his attention in 2018 by the Canadian Forces Ombudsman. Sajjan refused to say what he knew or who he told. What did you do with that information? Our conversations with the Ombudsman are obviously kept uh, uh, confidential. But one thing I can assure you, that any allegations or any information that were brought forward was always quickly and then taken to the appropriate authorities for the appropriate action. Senior government officials have not said why they did not choose to further investigate those allegations. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has not said if he was aware of the allegations. Mercedes Stevenson, Global News, Ottawa. In its crackdown on protesters in Myanmar, security forces opened fire, killing at least two people. <laughs> Riot police used water cannons and tear gas to disperse demonstrations in Mandalay, the second biggest city in the country, which is also known as Burma. Elsewhere, vigils were held for a 20-year-old woman who died yesterday after being shot in the head during a demonstration earlier this month. It's been nearly three weeks since the military seized control of the country and imprisoned Democratic leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Coming up, justice reform, rooting out discrimination in Canada's justice system. The Canadian government has tabled a bill to repeal 20 mandatory minimum sentences. The Justice Minister believes they disproportionately hurt Indigenous and Black people. But will this move address systemic racism in the court system? Mike Lecouture looks at justice reform that has the judges being judged. Being stopped by police, even being uh, just, just uh, harassed for no reason. Growing up as an Indigenous person in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Chief Derek Fox remembers feeling targeted as a result of systemic racism. It's a problem the government is trying to fix by removing some mandatory minimum penalties for certain offences. But Fox wonders what is being done to root out racism in the judicial system. We're not just going to see a sudden uh, decrease of uh, um, Indigenous and, or, or Blacks or people of colour within our jails. Une journée. Justice Minister David Lametti says judges and prosecutors want the discretion to use a conditional sentence instead of the mandatory minimum. But he also admits there's a certain degree of systemic racism in the judicial system and he hopes a bill already before Parliament will help. We have a bill in front of, uh, in front of Parliament right now that would uh, train judges not only in, in sexual assault but also other, other social contracts training. Some community activists say new training isn't enough to stop old habits created by mandatory minimum sentences. One idea is a system to judge judges. The goal is that this oversight committee would identify judges that have this bias. It's not going to be explicit, it's impl implicit, it's rooted in the judgment, and they would be barred from adjudicating cases with minorities or Indigenous communities. Many of the mandatory minimums the Liberals are targeting deal with drug possession. Lametti believes diversion programs like drug treatment can be an alternative to jail sentences. But those programs are already overburdened. Sort of opening the floodgate around the reduction in, in, in uh, minatory, ma mandatory minimums could have an impact in further uh, increasing wait lists uh, and time for people to access those services. The government has earmarked more than $28 million over the next five years for these types of programs. But Minister Lametti admits more funding will be needed. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. Still ahead, the vaccine risks and rewards for pregnant women.
Prince Philip is spending his fifth night in hospital, but did receive a visitor. His son, Prince Charles, was escorted through the back of the London hospital and spent a half hour with his father. The 99-year-old Duke of Edinburgh was feeling unwell when he was admitted Tuesday as a precaution. He had been isolated at Windsor Castle with the Queen. At another hospital, a newborn was named after the 99-year-old Philip. His granddaughter, Princess Eugenie, and her husband have named their baby boy August Philip Hawk Brooksbank. He's the Queen and Philip's ninth great-grandchild and 11th in line for the throne. Pfizer and BioNTech have started testing their COVID-19 vaccine on pregnant women. The study involves 4,000 women in nine countries, including Canada. Many public health officials have recommended pregnant women who are at high risk take the vaccine, even without proof it's safe for them. And as Sulin Goh explains, some Canadians have already made their choice. Calgary's Carrie Rayfuse is one of the first in the world to receive the COVID-19 vaccine as a breastfeeding mother. I didn't want to get it at first, um, but then once I started looking at the actual research, my opinion changed very quickly and I was uh, very eager to get it. The respiratory therapist returned from her maternity leave to the hospital last month and chose to be vaccinated. My exposure risk was very high. And then my risk of getting uh, critically ill with COVID is likely low, um, but I'm also seeing very vulnerable patients throughout the day. Because COVID vaccines have not been tested on pregnant or breastfeeding women, some say they should not be offered the shot until we have more data. Dr. Jonathan Zapersky feels they should have the choice. I think everybody sort of needs to make a decision uh, that takes into account their concerns, uh, their personal risk factors uh, of both acquiring uh, COVID-19. His team created a discussion framework for women and health care providers. Do the benefits outweigh the risks? Most pregnant women with COVID-19 will have mild symptoms, but 8 to 11 percent will be hospitalized. Two to 4% will need intensive care. There's also an increased risk of preterm births. Plus, women are more likely to work in frontline health care or essential service jobs. They deserve the opportunity to protect themselves uh, because they're putting, them, they're selves, putting themselves in harm's way on a daily basis. Anxiety levels could also be considered. Is the mother more stressed with or without the vaccine? It's scary. You want baby to be safe and healthy in your belly as long as possible. Stacy Brecken is due in March. She would love to get the shot. I mean, it would be really nice to have the option, not only to protect myself, but to protect my family. Sue Lingo, Global News, Edmonton. Diversity goals. Up next, the NHL's push to be more inclusive. That's Grand Slam number four for Japan's Naomi Osaka. The 23-year-old tennis star beat out Jennifer Brady at the Australian Open Women's Final. Osaka has won every major final she's ever reached. It was Brady's first, and she put up a good fight considering she had to quarantine in her hotel room for 15 days after a potential COVID exposure on the flight over. The city of Fredericton will honor hometown hero Willie O'Ree with a pair of skates. These custom-made skates honoring the NHL's first black player will be put on permanent display at Willie O'Ree Place in New Brunswick's capital. The skates were made in Canada to celebrate his achievements. The design features an image of O'Ree, his number 22, and phrases that include diversity, equality and inclusion. It's been 63 years since Willie O'Ree broke the color barrier in the National Hockey League. Yet diversity in the NHL today pales in comparison to other professional sports leagues. But as Suzette Francis tells us, the league is hoping to change that. Willie O'Ree became the NHL's first black player when he laced up his skates for the Boston Bruins in a game against the Montreal Canadiens on January 18, 1958. Nearly two decades later, Bill Riley would join the Washington Capitals, making him the third black player in the league. When I got there, I said, oh my goodness, it's easier to play up here than it is in the minors. Everybody's where they're supposed to be on the ice. But things in the majors weren't as smooth, with Riley facing racism on and off the ice. 
when you got called a lot of names and you got beer thrown at you, you got everything thrown at you. Trailblazers such as Ori and Riley struggled with racial inequality, but paved the way for many players of color in the game today. The NHL has long used the phrase, hockey is for everyone, but only 7% of its players are from diverse backgrounds, something the league is hoping to change. What we can do from an inclusion point of view is to educate our allies and our partners to making the sport more welcoming so that more kids of different backgrounds participate in the sport. There are 44 active BIPOC players currently in the league and another 46 in the system. In an effort to rectify this, the league has established grassroots programs to mentor young players across North America. It's a cultural awakening that employment in the front office has changed so that kids not only see people that look like themselves on the ice. That's where former NHLer Anthony Stewart comes in. Stewart centers, he scores! The Scarborough native who played professional hockey for over a decade calls a lack of diversity in the game a socioeconomic problem. It's way too expensive. The cost of ice is hundred hundreds of dollars an hour, equipments and skates. You're out of disadvantage before you even touch the ice. Stewart, who coaches two GTHL teams, has decided to pay it forward by creating Hockey Quality, an initiative geared towards giving children from diverse communities a chance to make it. For me, with my program in Hockey Quality, every dollar counts because it goes directly towards ice costs, registration, equipment costs, because within my network of my hockey school and teams, there are people that need the help. And regardless of where things currently stand, the NHL is hoping to become the most inclusive league in the world, something Stewart sees as a possibility. If there's 10 more people like-minded that have the same goals, why not? I say why not? Suzette Francis, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Robin Gill. We leave you tonight with the music of Canadian singer Buffy St. Marie. Little wheels spin and spin, big wheel turn around and around. Little wheel spin and spin. Here she is performing 55 years ago on Pete Seeger's TV show. The Indigenous musician and activist is celebrating her 80th birthday today. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night. Turn around and around. Merry Christmas, jingle bells.